It's time to talk Gonzaga basketball. Get ready. It's the Spoke Review Zags Insiders Podcast. Here we go. Here's Jim Meehan and Richard Fox. Good Monday morning. Welcome back to the Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast. Jim Meehan, Richard Fox with you for another half hour. We've got uh, a lot to talk about, even though the Zags didn't play from our last Monday podcast till now, but they do tonight. They open the uh, WCC tournament in the semifinals, play San Francisco, who they just got beating about a dozen days ago by 18 at the Chase Center. Uh, But first, let's kind of see where the Zags stand in the national landscape. Uh, Number 19 in the AP poll probably is going to move up. Uh, a few spots, even though they didn't play just because uh, teams have been getting knocked off in and around the number that they're at. So I would expect they might climb here uh, another spot or two. Uh, In the net, Foxy, we've got Gonzaga at 16. I think they jumped a spot or two there because Mm -hmm. I think Kentucky's win over Tennessee on the road. Uh, It's amazing how uh, those other results can influence your own ranking. And, and uh, I think that bumped the Zags up. St. Mary's 17, Kentucky 19. BYU is hanging in at 12. Remarkable first year for uh, the Cougars in the Big 12. We've got Washington State at 45. Tonight's opponent, San Francisco, is 63rd. And in the brackets, Foxy, and we talked about this last week, it, it does seem like the Zags have found some safe ground here that uh, uh, win or lose down in Vegas, they're, they're, they look like they're in the field. Uh, it's a matter of, of trying to bump their seating if they can with a couple of wins. Uh, I think if they were to lose tonight, they, they would uh, have a little more restlessness on Selection Sunday the night before. Uh, I think that might drop them into that 10, 11 range again, where you're, you're pretty uncomfortable waiting for your name to be called. But uh, I think if they go one and one lost to St. Mary's in the title game, they'd be in the eight, nine picture. If they win two, I think they could get up to the six line uh, is my guess. But uh, if you look at the brackets, they're, they're an eight, I believe with Jerry Palm playing Texas in Charlotte. Uh, another one I saw had them playing 10 Colorado in Charlotte Zags a seven seed and uh, Colorado of course with Billy Greer as an assistant coach and in that bracket the winner would play Arizona uh, if the second mm-hmm. seeded Arizona advanced so we'll see how it shakes out but just your general thought on where they sit the comfort level uh, uh, that they have right now in terms of being in the field. Well, I mean, it's just, it's remarkable. Even after that Kentucky game, I think we felt like they were on more solid footing, but still had a lot of work to do. Um, I'm with you. They're in no matter what. You know, they lose tonight, they're in. Um, now it is about kind of the seeding and trying to, you know, you, you don't know what the matchups look like. They won, you know, first round, let alone, you know, second or third round yet. It's impossible to really understand that, but um I'd certainly would rather be a five, six, seven seed than a you know nine, ten, or eleven seed, and that's now kind of what they're playing for. But more importantly, Jim, and you know this as well as I do, the momentum that they had to finish out that regular season coming off that Kentucky game was really remarkable. Yeah. Um, they they looked different. Um, and I thought against St. Mary's, I mean, that looked like a top ten team. That looked like about what we, uh, what I think on from a national perspective, people thought this team would look like going into the year. Um, I felt like they kind of finally landed there. Let's see how they look over the next couple of nights. Hopefully they get two games. Um, just these long breaks in between the end of the regular season, you know, these two games in, in Vegas, and then again, leading up to the first round. So um, I just want to see them keep the keep the momentum and the level that they've been at. To me, that's more important than anything. If you, if you play a really good, St. Mary's team tomorrow night or even tonight against San Francisco and you play well but lose, that's one thing versus if they come out and it looks flat, it looks a little disjointed, rusty, and that costs you a game, you know, I certainly would want to avoid that outcome. Yeah. Yeah, they need to uh, try to sustain what they've been doing or even build on it. Uh, It's (laughs) it's not that they're on this eight-game winning streak. It's how they've done it and how they've Mm -hmm. looked. Uh, they've won three quad one games on the road here 
And if you think about it, if they sweep down here and it's USF and St. Mary's, that's four quad ones and 10 games, all neutral site or on the road, another quad two, I think they would have a winning record in the quad one, quad two, which, you know, when they were 0-5, you know, a month ago, that was the last thought on your mind that they could pull that off. Yeah. So it does give them a chance to to jump up the the seed line if they have another successful couple nights down here. We'll see. Uh, Foxy, the hot topic of the week, uh, after we talked about our predictions last Monday, uh, the WCC individual awards came out, six of them this year. I think they split the newcomer and the freshman uh, because probably all the transfers were you right. know, in line for that newcomer of the year and the freshmen were, uh, were not getting as much run, so they have their own award now for freshmen. But uh, here's the recap real quick. Uh, Augustus Marshallonis. MVP from St. Mary's, Mitchell Saxon, Defensive Player of the Year, Randy Bennett, Coach of the Year, uh, Ryan Beasley, San Francisco, was the Freshman of the Year, Jonathan Mog uh, Mobo, I keep trying to mispronounce his name, the G is silent, uh, he was the <laughs> Newcomer of the Year, uh, those are how it, it shook out uh, uh, from the coaches voting, uh, those are not how I would have voted. Not how you would have voted. I think I went one for six. And the one I got right was Deuce Turner of San Diego uh, as the sixth man of the year. Uh, that was, I predicted the coaches would do that. My prediction myself would have been Ben Gregg of Gonzaga. But again, I don't think, the more I look at it, I'm not sure Benny qualified. He started 13 games in the conference out of 16. But regardless, that's how it shook out. Of those six, uh, awards. Uh, probably my biggest beef was with newcomer. I, I'm not sure how. Um, I'm not sure how Mobo would have uh, 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 taken that over Graham Ek or Ryan Nemhard for uh, Gonzaga. Head-to-head -head meetings, stats, uh, the way Ek finished, the way Nemhard has played in conference. Uh, don't get me wrong. Mobo has had an excellent year. He's a great player. He's a pro prospect. He's got a really live body, 6'8", bouncy, uh, but doesn't uh, has not been all that aggressive when he's faced the Zags, at least in the scoring end of things. And his numbers against the better teams in the conference haven't been great. Uh, they've been good, but they haven't been great compared to, to Graham or, or Nemhard. That's probably my biggest beef. I can live with, with Marshall Onis. As the player of the year, the, the best guy on the best team, they won the league. Um, numerically, stat-wise, maybe not, but that's not uh, – the, winning the league carries a lot of weight, and it should. Uh, you know, Randy Bennett, to me, was a no-brainer that he was going to win coach of the year, guiding them back from that rough uh, spell they had uh, about a month into the season. I think they had five losses. So uh, if it wasn't Marshall Onis, I think it would have been E.K., on the MVP, that'd been my guess. Uh, I had Anton Watson winning Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine he's he's going to end his career without winning that award once at, at yeah. Gonzaga. Um, so probably those newcomer Defensive Player and slightly surprised by by MVP. Where do you come down on what the coaches voted <laughs> out? Well, I had I, in my mind, I had this, you know, really, really good um, rant. You know, I was going to pull out the soapbox, but I decided to check to see how how sturdy the soapbox was going to be. And so I, I went and I looked and I said, thought to myself, well, how many of these leagues do it this way where they have the coaches vote versus having uh, either the media do it or the media involved? And it's interesting, just the Big Ten and ACC have a media component, uh, you know, Big 12, Pac-12, SEC, Mountain West, it's just coaches. So, I mean, that that certainly seems to be how most of these conferences do it. Um, I still would argue that I think having a media component to it makes a lot more sense. A, a, you're getting to 50, 60, 70 members that are voting versus, you know, 10 coaches or whatever the case might be. And, um, you know, coaches are people. And I think at times there's a bit of a anti-Gonzaga sentiment, I think, in some of these votes. Um, just because I think a lot of these coaches think Gonzaga has it pretty easy. And um, it, it, there's just a little bit of that shine is gone. And I, I think you look at last year, Watson not getting any recognition. 
uh, Pajemski getting uh, co-player of the year with, with Rutimi. You know, we could go back over the last, call it five or six years, and probably yeah. have, have some bad scratchers. But, um, you know, the way the league does it is odd, though. Ten members of the first team. It's like, a, who's, the, who's the genius who thought – uh, that that was a good idea and couldn't comprehend the first, second, and third team. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no defensive team; just one one player is called out. It, it's nobody else does it this way. So I did look at that. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think it's a function of if it was important to the coaches, it'd be different. And you know, coaches are here for a long time, both uh, at schools and in the profession. These guys are in here for now, nowadays, one, two, maybe four years. This stuff really matters to guys. And it means a lot to a player to get that recognition. And I just think the league does it incorrectly. And there's, you know, certainly my voice doesn't carry any weight, but um, I just think there's a lot. You, you You look through it and there's just constantly guys who get overlooked or, Guys who get recognized that maybe shouldn't be, but they're part of a winning team, and mm-hmm. you know, coaches are uh, always val- probably overweighting that a little bit. Sometimes um, there's something to be said for a guy on the fifth place team that's carrying a massive load compared to the third best player on the second best team in the league. Mm-hmm. So you know, that's I'll step off the soapbox now. Like I said, it's not as sturdy as I wanted it to be, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, look, I, I think Sa- I mean Saxon's a worthy. Um, selection for defensive player of the year. I, I don't think that's egregious, but if you look at, you know, Anton soon led the league in steals, both in the non-conference and over both in conference and in overall, um, had 21 blocks over 30 games. So, you know, did a good job in that category. And obviously the most versatile defender in the league by probably a wide margin, maybe Mobu you, you throw in there. Um, but, I, you know, I, I didn't, I, I, I didn't, think that that was egregious the newcomer of the year to me is just absurd and i like mobu i agree with you he's a pro prospect we're going to see him play in the league um he's had a phenomenal year he has you know that san francisco, san francisco team without him is probably not finishing third yeah. but you look at what he did against gonzaga and st mary's i mean in 32 minutes less than 10 points a game less than nine rebounds shot it well 56 percent, but didn't shoot it very often 56% from the free throw line, didn't get there a bunch, three assists and almost three turnovers. Just not an impact. If I took his name off, if you didn't know the, the stat line, you'd be, you think I'd be describing a solid role player. So I, I just don't know where that's coming from, particularly with the impact EK and Neymar have had as transfers. Uh, it, it's just difficult for me to understand, unless they split their vote. But then again, that's why you need more than 10 people voting. Um, I think you really land on 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 the real um on the real players there. And um but look at, at the end of the day, St. Mary's uh you know won the won the league and um you know to the to the, the winner goes to spoils. You know, certainly I, I agree with you. I think Bennett did a tremendous job. He does it every year. What's this? Yeah. It's his third time, third time in a row, I think he's gotten the award. Um but it's interesting, you know, I had a buddy of mine text me uh, about uh, the awards and was made a good point about Mark. You know, look, he loses the all-time leading score, first-round draft pick. You know, Smith doesn't come back. Hunter and Harris leave. <laughs> and once again, they find a way to reload and put all these new pieces together. And they have ventures go out at the start of the year with you know, for the whole season. You know, this has been one of Mark's better uh, coaching performances and – um, you know, I'd be interesting if you opened it up to the to a larger pool of voters, you know, how that might have looked. But yeah. um, I think this is where we're at with this stuff, Jim. It, it's um, it's getting harder and harder to take these these end of the year awards seriously for this conference, in my opinion. Yeah, and I, I, I think your point's well taken that I don't know, does any other league do it with 10 on the first team? It literally makes no sense. No. That's the first. Not, not, not that's I the look first through whole it, team. Unless I that's the whole it. roster. <laughs> it's crazy, and it's just it's just to make any sense. It's like a high school deal. We yeah. don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, you know. I mean, look, I, I, I coach my kids. They're seven seven years old. Everybody gets to play. At some point, you got to be a player to play. Well, at some level, we're you know we're going to acknowledge and recognize performance, and it's not difficult to have three teams. It just isn't. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. All right. Enough of that award stuff. We've, uh, 
we've been talking about it for several days, still getting emails and calls about it. So let's move on. We got the semifinals tonight. Mm -hmm. Gonzaga, San Francisco, volume three. Uh, Zags win in Spokane, 77-72, led by 13 late. Made it real interesting by giving up a bunch of threes and missing a bunch of free throws. Go down to San Francisco, play at the Chase Center, and I think uh, took the lead right at the end of the half on an Anton Watson bucket, 35-34, if my memory's right. Took off and kind of just uh, dominated the final 20 minutes, led by as many as 29. Uh, we're up 20 within, you know, six, seven minutes of the second half. Uh, just took over that game, both ends of the floor. Uh, kind of did a, a nice job on, on Mobo again. Uh, and, and EK has been the primary defender uh, both times they've played. I know Ben Gregg's gotten shots at him. I know Anton's been on him a little. But a lot of times it's, it's uh, EK, and he did a very nice job again uh with usf's best players so we don't really talk about graham's defense but he has been very solid against uh against mobo in both meetings and as well as saxon i thought he did a nice job at, at st mm -hmm. mary's when matched up there so uh to me it's up to usf to to, to figure out the adjustments and and try to get uh, mobo into that 17 18 20 point range that he's very capable of doing um, you know, the matchups are going to be good. You've got the backcourts are very good. Thomas and, and Williams for San Fran. You've got Nemhard, Nolan with the Zags. Uh, those are big matchups. I think Anton Watson might be due for a little breakout here. He was uh, uh, a little quiet on the road trip to the Bay. Uh, I think he's probably stewing a little bit about that. Uh, maybe not real pleased he didn't win Defensive Player of the Year. Who knows? Uh, but I think he might be in for a big night. Uh, if you're USF, if you're Kyle Bankhead, your buddy uh, mm -hmm. that you played with that puts the scout together as a USF assistant coach and does a great job. His scouts are noticeably impressive. Uh, how do you, you know, how do you turn this around if you're a Don? Well, look, they played decent against a not, a, 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 not a very good team in Portland on Saturday night. You know, shot it well from both uh, the field and from three, 46 percent. Only got to the line six times, but that game never really was in doubt. Um, you know, kind of just solid 18 assists on 28 field goals made. It, you know, I, I almost think some, sometimes you just sit down with your guys and kind of put your hands up and say, fellas, we, we just have to put it together against either one of these two teams. You know, and it bears repeating. We talked about it la on the last pod, you know, for San Francisco against everybody that isn't a Gale or a Zag. They're averaging 83 points a game, shooting better than 50% from the field, 35 from three, and averaging 18 assists to 10 turnovers. Against the Gales and St. Mary's, I mean, those numbers just plummet. 67 points a game, 42% from the field, sub 30 from three, and only 10 assists, or rather 11 assists and 11 turnovers. So... You know, the question for San Francisco is, can we get everybody on the same page on one night? Because they've had, you know, there's Newberry was great up here, but terrible down at the Chase Center. Mobu just, you know, he's oozing in potential and, and you can see the ability, but, you know, it's kind of a wallflower in these games. He's just not aggressive. And I mean, you, you, we're obviously um, wanting Gonzaga to do well, but I mean, I find myself like looking at him play and think, th think, can you give me more? I just want to see what it would look like if you said, I'm going to force it here and try to get 14 to 15 shots tonight uh, and put real foul pressure on Gonzaga's bigs because despite how good Huff is and the, and the, the depth they have up front with the three bigs starting and you can absorb foul trouble for Graham, he is the key. I mean, he is the one guy that if you took him or you know removed him from the from the equation for Gonzaga, they're still very good. But that's that's a huge. I don't think they can fill that void, uh, particularly in a in a in a in an in game type of dynamic. So, um, you know, they need Williams to play well. They need Beasley to come off the bench, freshman of the year, play well. Thomas, to, I mean, they need their top six or seven to play well. They can't turn it over. It feels like some of the turnovers they've had against Gonzaga have just been careless and silly. Yeah. Um, but you know, as, as you know, uh, if Mark hasn't already said it, he'll probably say it another six times before tip off. It's hard to beat teams three times, good teams, three times. And, 
you know, it feels like San Francisco has been knocking on the door. They've been real close against some, you know, quad one teams over the course of the year. At some point, a team like that's going to break through. Yeah, no, you're dead right. That's that's the thing, is this is a very capable team. And we've seen it firsthand because we saw Thomas and Williams hitting threes all over the place. And they're big, strong, physical guys. These are, mm-hmm. these are not, you know, freshman 170 pound guys. This is 200 pound guys who can put it on the deck and get their own. Uh, Mobo, by all accounts, he's a great kid too. Oh, I yeah. mean, he is a, you can just tell he's a good kid and a hardworking kid. He's made himself into a hell of a player. Uh, if you're a Zag fan, you probably wanted him to be quiet again tonight, but it, it, at some point that's probably not going to be the case. I mean, he is going to have the fire lit under him as well. I think they feel like they found something against Portland. They looked like they did a couple, three, four weeks ago. And if they can carry that through, it's going to be very interesting tonight. So uh, that's going to be that's going to be an interesting game. And and I expect the Dons, as as Mark will say as well, hard hard to beat a team three times. Uh, desperation level is, I was is just definitely thinking that. In, a thing. And this, they're two wins from going to the NCAA tournament. That's how yep. they're thinking. And they should think that way. And mm-hmm. you know how strange things get in conference tournaments. Maybe not here, because it seems like it's Gonzaga St. Mary's every year. <laughs> but every other tournament, you've got these crazy upsets and bid stealers, all those things. That's what they want to do. So uh, Zags would be well advised to be on their game tonight, because I think the Dons are going to bring it. And, and they do have some depth. They can bring in some guys that, you know, they, they'll go eight, nine deep. Uh, we'll see how the Zags handle it. And uh, they've, they've been masterful. They've gone to the title game, what, 26 years in a row. Another mm-hmm. incredible number and in all the streaks they have. That's that's one for the books, too. So the other semi, I think, is going to be very interesting. You've got Santa yeah. Clara, St. Mary's. Gales are without Josh Jefferson, who was just a perfect uh, uh, kind of uh, small forward, big forward for them. A knee injury out for the year. We saw what they looked like without him when the Zags took it to him in, in Moraga, 70 to 57. Broncos have true size, true yeah. depth. They've got five bigs that are all pretty effective. Uh, they got a pretty good guard line, although they were missing the, the napper kid. The, the point guard did not play in their, in their win in the quarters, but Dama Ball is back, and he looks good. They, they have some potential. And another team that has broken through and beaten some good people, they beat Washington State. They've got some Pac-12 wins. Uh, they're sitting there going, oh, we just got to win two games here, and we're in the NCAA tournament. we got a team good enough to do that. Uh, how do you see that game going? It starts at 6 tonight. How do you see the Broncos and Gales going? I think you hit it right on the head there. It's it's just going to be a difficult matchup for St. Mary's in that the size that Santa Clara has is different. Um, it's just, it's quite frankly, Gonzaga, we were, we're going to custom to Gonzaga having that kind of size, but generally in the conference, you just don't, you're not able to do that. Um, it's, you know, you can, I think you, you can put San Francisco and Santa Clara in the same category, which is I think both those teams came into the season thinking they had a pretty good group and could win a, win a few games. And San Francisco is certainly going to be feel a little bit better about where they ended up in the regular season, finishing third. But I think both groups feel like they left something on the table throughout the course of the year. You know, Santa Clara wins at home against Gonzaga and just isn't able to build on them the way they would have wanted to. They've had injuries, have, you know, never can put it together against St. Mary's. You know, San Francisco, a ton of quad one opportunities, not able to take advantage of that. But here they both are, two games left, if they can win out, to go to the tournament. And both those teams are going to believe they can win two games in two nights. So you, you, you couple that desperation with actually good teams. And this is not LMU or Pacific that's made a little run here. Yeah. And now they're in the semifinal. These are teams that believe they should be in this game. So... Yeah, you know, I, I, for St. Mary's, the Jefferson loss, I don't think can be um, overstated on how much of an impact that is for them. You know, Harry Weasel hasn't played since, I think, February 20th. I don't know if you forgot an update on him, but, you know, he's, yeah. not a, a, he's not been a major component to the rotation, but averaging about 10 minutes a game, he's 7'1", 255. That's nice if you can get him in the game 
tonight for that's, six to that's seven small minutes. small by Santa Clara standards, but he, yeah, he's a big guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's just another body, right? And, and you know, it looked to me like Saxon against the Zags looked worn down by the end of that game. And yeah, so, no question. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 harder for a big to play those extended minutes because of how physical their job is versus a guard who's certainly up and down running, but physically you're not necessarily getting hit every time down the floor. So, um, you know, I, I'd be, I would not be surprised if Santa Clara found a way to win that game. I, I'd be surprised if Gonzaga lost tonight. I think they're just better than the Dons, even though the Dons have, you know, have the capacity to beat them. I just don't, I'd be surprised if that happened. I won't be surprised uh, tomorrow morning or rather tonight if uh if St. Mary's loses. The one thing I would say is I think the key for them is is uh Dukas. Yeah. Um he played better at home against Gonzaga, but was you know put together a real dud up in, in Spokane. But over the last 10 games, including those two games against the Zags, he's averaging 13.7 rebounds, shooting 58% from three. They need him to have a good night tonight. And if they win and play Gonzaga, he's the guy I'm watching. If Dukas can get going um scoring the ball they're they're just that helps absorb some of that loss from jefferson and i still think makes them a really difficult out yeah, I, I think that game comes down to to who can get the other to play their style more now you're never going to do that totally with saint mary's they're not going to let you go up and down and score 80 and they're not going to turn it over 18 times that doesn't happen but you saw with the zags they turned them over a little in the first half yeah. Uh, in Moraga, and they put 44 on the board. You know, it didn't last. They had 26 in the second half. But but whoever can get that style leaning their way, San, Santa Clara can get some easy buckets instead of a grind every 30 seconds down the floor. And the same thing at the other end, trying to guard St. Mary's for 30 seconds. Uh, I think that's who's going to survive that game. And and uh, I, I, I think the Gales, uh, they're favored. They're the, the regular season champs. It's kind of up to Santa Clara to, to show they can pull that off. Well, Foxy, we promised we'd go back to volume one, our first show of the year, where we boldly mm-hmm. step out there, put our opinions out there, mocked by the masses, you know, I'm <laughs> sure. But, hey, let's go back through. And, Foxy, uh, uh, if I could reach you, I'd pat you on the back. I think we did oh, a pretty good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank man, you. I think we did a pretty decent job at the outset. Uh, let's go through them real quick here. We uh, we were I asked you to pick the leading scorer for Gonzaga. You went completely out on a limb back at that time. You said <laughs> one young Nolan Hickman, and he has not been their leading scorer, but he has been surprisingly their second leading scorer uh, in conference. He's over 15 a game, mm-hmm. and he has scored more than I thought he would, way more than I thought he would. I thought I could see him being fourth or fifth, at that time, Venters was in the lineup when we talked. Yeah, he had yeah. not been. We were not aware if he'd been hurt or not. But uh, I went with Ek. That was the even money favorite, like picking Drew Timmy last year, maybe, and not quite that that way. But uh, and he turned out to be the leading scorer. He's on just an incredible run here. So I commend you for that pick. Uh, uh, we had options. We could have gone Anton. We could have gone Nemhard. Yeah, yeah. Venters was even in that mix. Uh, but here's the thing I really pat you on the back for. You mentioned in that first show the three big lineup, I think, because you could kind of see Huff was spent that red shirt year and was going to be a factor. Ben Gregg is always a factor. Right. Then you got the two horses with Anton and, and EK that are just terrific players. Uh, and you mentioned it in that first show uh, of the year. And, and I kind of been on board with that, too. We, even, we talked about this months ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you could tell that those guys were going to be, uh, you know, a prominent part of the rotation. Uh, and, and it's turned out that way. And, and that, that is one of the things that turned this season around. When, when Ben Gregg got in that lineup, gave him a real viable fifth scoring option. He's scoring right around 10 a game since he started. Uh, so kudos for that. Uh, <laughs> did, you, did you have your uh, – you must have had your J- Johnny Carson. What was that old bit he did with the – Karnak, uh, he knew uh, the future. Uh, what what made you say that back uh, three months, four months ago? Just, just, you just know, genius. Throw, the- well, I was, I was going to say just throwing crap on the wall and hoping it sticks. No, um, I think uh, you know. Look, you, you, yeah, 
Ventures was in the mix at the time. So you had Ventures, Nemhard, and Hickman. And we, I think we both liked what Stromer could do, but didn't, uh, probably felt like he was going to be in the role that, that he probably should have been throughout the year, which was at 10, 10 to 15, 12 to 15 minutes a game. Um, and they're if you look at a team's top seven players, it's always interesting to, or even top eight, you know, what positions do they p- play? And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I don't think I would have put Stromer in the top seven and I saw four bigs in that rotation and I, you just have to find a way to play that way. And also, I think you want to, um, you don't want to play different for the sake of just playing different. You want to play different if you can create an advantage and just the size that you can play with is pretty unique at the college level. Um, and Gonzaga, you know, we, we've had some, we've had some luck, uh, but it's been kind of hit, you know, sporadic on finding big wings, you know, proper small forwards that can really play on the perimeter. It's not a very long list for Gonzaga. Um, but that's also, to be fair, a difficult position to identify at any level, including the NBA, you know, high level guys who can play that, that two or th- two, three role. And I just thought the ability with, with uh, Greg's ability to shoot the ball, yeah. um, that it would work, you know. But, I, I, you know, to be fair, um, it wasn't until Ventures got out and we kind of saw the early returns where the idea to me came that maybe you'd go with Greg in the starting lineup and it certainly eventually they got there. And I don't know if I would have been able to – I don't know if I would have called out the numbers that Greg has had. Yeah. So um, let's call it some dumb luck and uh more of an idea than a well thought out thing but i think it's really worked out for them they've done an amazing job they being the staff and greg and more importantly of making that work because that's certainly not a position uh, a place he's ever been put on the floor which is we're going to have you play in the, the perimeter this much it's, there's a whole different it's a totally different experience when my job is, as a big that can shoot is just to spot up to now I need to move without the ball, put the ball on the floor, and then make make solid plays. And then, oh, by the way, it's not as if on offense you're playing on the perimeter and on defense you've got your garden of, of center. We need you now to move your feet and actually keep guys in front. And I think on balance, Ben has been tremendous this year. Um, I don't think we can understate the impact that he's had. Um, and this is the case every year, as you know. It's not just one guy. It's a collection of people on a team all fit, fitting into their role. And it's just, but what's remarkable this year is like, if you took out any of them from the equation, it doesn't work. They've all been that important. Graham, Nemhard, Anton, Hickman, and Greg. You take any one of those five guys out of the mix, you know, I, I don't even think we're, I think we're talking about they got to win the tournament. So yeah. um, it's been, it was a good adjustment on their part, no doubt. Well, and again, if I could reach you, pat you on the back. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. About three, four weeks before it actually happened, also talked about Ben Gregg going into the starting line. And it eventually happened, and it's been a big factor in how they've turned it around. Well, just just remember this when when I get them all wrong next year, okay? Just remember this when I get it all wrong. Well, no, no, I'm going to bring you back to earth right now because we did pick pick final. We're over time. We got to stop. We got to stop. We're over time. (laughs) <laughs> oh, we're close. We're close. Uh, we did pick final records. Uh, you oh, had the Zags. I, I don't with, remember that. Yeah. Well, let me remind you. You had okay. uh, the Zags with four losses through the regular season, uh, which would be what twenty six and four. four no. Mm-hmm. no. I had them finishing, I think twenty eight and seven. So okay. I'm still in the neighborhood. We'll see, but. Uh, both of those are, are right near the mark. I guess we'll wrap it up with this. Your your thoughts on floor and ceiling for what this team will do in the NCAA tournament. I, I think the highest they go or the farthest they go is Sweet, sweet 16. That's my guess they will do that. Um, I think they could, could go farther if things broke right in the matchups and the seedings. Uh, but that's where I have them uh, going. Uh, what uh, what say you? What uh, floor ceiling for this group? I'm going to trust what how I felt after last weekend, um, which is they look to me like a top ten team, um, and I'm not going to over overthink it. And you know, I haven't seen them play in a while, and you know, what's the layoff going to be, and all that stuff. 
Um, but I, you know, if you had asked me that question last week on the podcast, I think I would have told you um, they're no worse than a second weekend team. And um, I'm not going to be surprised if we're watching them in an, in, in, in an Elite Eight game. This isn't a team that's going to win a national championship. This is a, a team that they made a Final Four. I think that would be um, maybe the most impressive run Gonzaga's ever had. But this is a team that is going to be a problem for anybody they play. I don't care if they end up being a 10 seed. If they're playing the way they did last weekend, that's going to be a tough out for anybody. If they can win out the next couple nights and now they get a six seed, let's call it, and uh, you, you hopefully get a better matchup from a talent perspective, um, we should be talking about their Sweet 16 matchup. And depending on that matchup, I won't be surprised. So I think we're all, I think we're landing on the same play. play, play. Yeah on the same place, but I just was so impressed with how they looked. St. Mary's is good. And I know they don't have Jefferson and that's a big part of it, but even without him, they are just a nightmare to play and to go down there in that, in that environment, uh, in a game that, <clears throat> you know, meant a ton for Gonzaga and St. Mary's, even though they locked up the league, that senior night, you, you're trying to go undefeated in the conference. I'm not, I don't think St. Mary's has ever done that. They haven't. Um, yeah. So they had a lot to play for. Um, I'm going to trust myself, and it's, it, I'm going to I'm going to go elite eight right elite eight today. And uh, I feel I feel like I'm out on a limb there a little bit. I think you took the easy road. You know, you're not quite as brave as I am, but let's see where we land. All right, let's see where we land. <laughs> well, I uh, look if they're an eight, nine, seven, ten, six, it's a surprise that they get to the Sweet Sixteen. They would not be favored technically by seeding to get there right, right to get through two games so my limb is just a little smaller than the one you're out there on so anyway that's uh that's gonna do it boxy enjoyed it as always there's nothing yep. like march basketball mm -hmm. uh, april basketball is pretty good those last two yeah, two yeah, games, yeah. Uh, of the year so we'll see how far uh, the ride takes us starts tonight in vegas i'm sure you all be watching me and foxy will be back next monday to wrap it all up and look forward to we should know some things by then, NCAA tournament-wise, so that'll be a good mm -hmm. show to tune into as well. So thanks for joining us every Monday. We will be back next Monday. Take care.